In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a time, well within my memory, when the term Christian was a synonym for the better values of our community. A Christian person or a Christian family were those who did what our society expected of them. They were unfailingly courteous and kind, and they went to church. In that bygone era, to be Christian was to conform to the culture. But that's no longer the case. In this secular age, we do not use religious language to describe our better nature. The virtues of the culture haven't changed a great deal, but the way we describe them has. So the term Christian has been let go. Its former role is now outsourced to Miss Manners, Carolyn Hacks, and Bill Gates. And I think this is probably a good thing, if only because it allows us to better understand Jesus' meaning when he said in today's gospel that salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The point is that being a Christian is something unique, unlike the culture, unlike the world around us, as different from the world as the taste of salt is from all others. Being a Christian is not about conformity, even to the better instincts of the community. To be a Christian is to be different. I would like to talk with you this morning about that difference, about having salt in ourselves about some of the ways that we are called to be different from the world around us. Now, probably the most basic difference is that, for us, life is a big thing. I mean, a really, really big thing. It is not something sandwiched in between birth dates and death dates. It stretches way beyond the grave and into eternity. We are the people who follow Jesus' investment advice to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. We are the people who share the vulnerability described by St. Paul when he said, If it is for this life only that we have hoped, we are most to be pitied. Our race is a marathon, long, not a sprint. The Christian view is not only that there is life beyond the grave, but that that life beyond the grave is intricately and intimately connected to life on this side of the grave. That's important. In my line of work, I bury a lot of people. Many of them have ignored religion all of their lives. But at the end, when faced with death, or their own, or someone they care about, the tendency is to grab hold of the notion that death is a fresh start on a new life, and that all is forgotten, all is forgiven, all is foregone. The idea is that God is waiting at the grave like a doting grandparent, who has in one hand a cosmic cookie and in the other eternal glass of milk assuring us that nothing matters except the uncritical love that God has for us. Now, comforting as that may be, it does manage to miss one of the basic truths about life. A truth so basic that every one of us who have children have repeated it over and over and over in the raising of those children. And the basic truth is this. What we do now matters later. What we do now matters later. That's why we take naps. That's why we don't eat cookies just before dinner. That's why you need to get started on your science project. It's one reason we lead moral and ethical lives. What we do now matters later. It's also why our faith and most others have some concept of heaven and hell. 
Jesus talked about it in the gospel for this morning. Forget the lurid details. The message of all that is basic and simple. What we do now matters later. This life and the choices we make are intricately and intimately connected to the next life. And that Christian view is not only distinct from the cheap piety of frightened agnostics, but from a growing trend in our culture. You may have read about a large number of undergraduates at Harvard who were implicated in a cheating scandal. And in reflecting on that, one professor wrote in an op-ed piece in the, in the Post that the real culprit is a culture of immediate and continuous success. The point was that winning was all that counted, the only thing that was important. And so the principles like honesty, for example, were rendered abstract and then finally a mere distraction. That's a view of life as a little thing, squeezed in between birth and death. Our view and our subsequent behavior as Christians is quite different. In the same way that people who run a marathon do it differently from those who run a hundred yard dash, people who see life as a big thing, intricately and intimately connected, will live very differently from those who see it as a little thing, squeezed between the tombstone's dates, unmoored to either principle or consequence. We Christians, we know that life is a big thing. And we know that truth is a big thing. That's a fact that we people of faith honor more often in the breach than the observance, to quote Shakespeare. We forget it regularly. But understanding truth to be a big thing is an essential part of our saltiness. In today's gospel, the disciples are all in a snip because someone was healing people in Jesus' name, but he wasn't a card-carrying disciple. And Jesus says to them, oh, guys, for crying out loud, this is one of the newer translations. You may not have this at home, but he says, guys, for crying out loud, truth, guys, is a big thing. It's a big thing. And it doesn't fit in the little categories by which we define ourselves. That's what Moses said to Joshua in the first lesson. Don't worry about Eldad and Medad. They've got some truth out there. It's a big thing. God's truth does not fit into formulas or philosophies. It does not fit into creeds or cathedrals or denominations or declarations. Those things can and usually do contain some piece of God's truth, but never all of it. Never, never enough to justify the arrogance by which we present ourselves. Truth said Jesus to Nicodemus the Pharisee, truth is like wind. You don't contain the wind, Nicodemus. As a matter of fact, when you contain it, the first thing that happens is it ceases to be wind at all. We Christians have a piece of the truth, a big piece, but a piece nonetheless. Islam has a piece. So does Judaism. So does science. Communism has some truth to it. The Tea Party has truth in it. So does the AFL-CIO. The list goes on and on. Truth is a big thing, a big thing, way too big for any of us to control, much less to corner. And the business of being truthful involves finding ways to connect the pieces of truth that people have so that larger and greater truth emerges. Being truthful does not include the currently thrilling sport of using my piece of truth to beat you into submission. How different would the political campaigns be if they knew that truth was a big thing? How different would Congress be? How different would foreign policy be? How different would this church be if we remembered that? Life is a big thing. 
truth is a big thing. And we, we are not big things. Now that stunning bit of information has some nuance to it. You can't just drive by it and see it. We have to stop and get out and take a closer look. So we're going to do that. God, God lavishes extraordinary attention on the lame and the least and the lost. When Jesus began his ministry, he took Isaiah's old words and made them his own. He said his primary concern was going to be for the poor, the captive, the blind, and the oppressed. The poor in spirit, the captive of addiction or grief, blind to esteem, oppressed by life. And that theme runs all through God's revelation. The word of God to those who are poor, captive, blind, oppressed, is one of comfort and rest, refreshment, forgiveness, understanding, unshakable love. The lame and the least and the lost are of primary importance in the kingdom of God. God calls them his lambs, his lambs. The problem is that the category of the lame and the least and the lost does not describe many of us. In this world, it does not describe me to any degree. And without asking for a show of hands, my guess is it doesn't describe very many of you either. We are in a different category. By this world's measure, we are the fit, the foremost, and the found. We are loved, certainly. But God calls us servants not lambs. And the words of God for us include stewardship, labor, expectation, and the washing of feet. The blessings of God, which we enjoy in abundance, are revealed to be investments on which God expects substantial return. We are called vineyards that are meant to yield profits. We are fig trees that are meant to produce fruit. We are lights that were made to shine. We are the ones to whom much has been given and from whom much is required. We are the ones who, when we fail to yield, produce, shine, and meet expectation, are the focus of Old Testament wrath and New Testament displacement. We. We, the fit, the foremost, and the found, have overheard God's word to the lame and the least and the lost and thought it was for us. Big mistake. Big mistake. It has tricked us into thinking that we are of primary importance in the kingdom of God, but we are not. We are servants. Servants are seldom in the center. That mistake causes us to lose a lot of our salt. For we are meant to be unique, as different from the world around us as salt is from everything else. We are marathoners in a world of sprinters. We are truth seekers in a world that thinks that truth has been found. We are servants in a world of lost lambs. We are called, chosen, and crafted by God to live a big life, a big life that stretches in intricate patterns into eternity, to live with big truth, the kind that can only be known in broken pieces that cry out for one another. We are crafted by God to be servants, endowed with great love, great gifts, 
and great responsibility. So have salt in yourselves, said Jesus. Be salt and be at peace with one another. Amen.